lecture presentation. Are you ready? Streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts with Brad and Jay. Yeah, what a stupid question. <laughs> oh, I've already had two glasses, too, of Tennessee whiskey. Jay, we've done, you've done so good, and you have to muck it up right at the end. <laughs> Jay's gray. He's all gray now. Look at his beard. <laughs> I, mean, I got grayer, right? <laughs> uh, everyone in the chat, thanks for stopping by and join yourselves. We know you did. Just here with us. Joining us tonight to talk about robbing banks, kidnapping, and bootlegging, the author of The County Line, Steve Weddle. Welcome to the show. I feel like I need to take a shower. Are we having a conversation backstage about the new Batman? No, uh, Batman's good. Don't get no, it twisted, Jay. Uh, that's Look, just, Steve was about to leave already. He, I know. You're, exactly. already, you're already making him leave. Right. What's up, everyone? Welcome <laughs> to another exciting episode of Paper Cuts. It hasn't even started yet, but we're going to say it's exciting. That's what we do. I'm Jay. <laughs> that's that's Brad over there joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to we're going to get gritty. We're going to talk about uh, some crime, some bootlegging, some uh, kidnapping, and uh, in a book. Yeah. Steve Weddle's with us this evening, everyone. Hello, Steve. How how are things? Hey, hey, how Look are y'all? We Thanks. We all we all pick up the book in unison here. Everyone have their drinks. What are we drinking tonight? Anything? Just just water tonight, Jay. Just water. In my look, my, my cool Jurassic Park cup, though. Look at that, Daddy yeah. Source. Daddy Source, you'll get your ass kicked. You know. I oh, got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, as you can tell, I'm drinking. Uh, what is this? Uh, Coors Light. So. <laughs> water so steve what's going on man i don't know you guys asked me on here i don't know i don't know why that's as far as we go we, 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 ask on, we hope you have stuff <laughs> yes yeah. yeah. so it's, it, this is a self-interview portion you guys were talking about right yeah i didn't Just, know we were we'll starting with that but okay <laughs> we can start with that if you want I mean, nothing's rehearsed from the show so just do it no i'm, I'm aware <laughs> yeah i've seen this show before so you have exactly. your new book your newest book the county line this came out earlier this year right yeah it came out uh the pub date was supposed to be um january 16th uh mm-hmm. which is, happens to be uh, my lovely bride's birthday and so we were all kind of psyched about that at the Weddell house and then they reached out um last year that, hey we're going to move it to february the first and i said okay, okay what, did, what did i screw up we got <laughs> we got we need a couple more weeks i think they said no we want to put it into a promotion into the amazon first read so that you know people can get it for free if you're an mm-hmm. M prime member for, for the month of january and then it comes out february 1st um for everybody else in paper and on kindle and that sort of thing so it's it's kind of confusing because it came out jan you know the first of january but it really came out february 1st so i think the answer <laughs> to your question when you said it came out earlier this year my answer should have been yep it yes is. yep exactly yeah i was <laughs> gonna ask you about like, the whole amazon first read sure. thing so how does how does that happen how does how did you get picked from a lottery or was your last book to yeah my uh um it or? no well you know they pick you know, five or six books a month that they want to select and uh, put into this program called Amazon First Read so that if you have Amazon Prime, you can read it for free in that month. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've, you know, as a reader, I've taken advantage of it. And to be honest, never considered what it was like to be an author (laughs) because I just enjoy getting the book and that sort of thing. So, you know, they send it out, you know, and and, uh, so thousands of people read it in that first month. And the way that I found out about it was, I don't know, three or four months before um, my agent, um, emailed me and said, um, I need to call you, um, which is, uh, which I have learned is, um, code for, I have good news, you know? Um, so, you know, he gave me a call and he said, uh, this is great. And I said, what is it? And he explained it to me and I said, Oh, this sounds great. Uh, so it was great. You know, it, uh, uh, was. And so what happens is thousands of people who would never see your book, right. You know, pick it up, you know? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it was quite the experience. Yeah, because so I get those emails too. Are you getting a lot of reviews from from from? Well, yeah, I, you know, a lot of reads and a lot of reviews. I don't, um, I I don't, 
I'm opposed to reading uh, reviews, uh, mm -hmm. but you just get, I mean, my reviews, I read other reviews to say, oh, I thought this book was going to be crap. I'm not reading it. But my own book, I, you know, uh, reviews, uh, I think, are for uh, readers to talk right, right, right. to mm -hmm. other readers. So I try to avoid them. Um, uh, I do have people who look for good stuff and try to send me something every once in a while if anybody says anything nice, because, you know, you have to have to fuel the writer. So, uh, but in terms of reviews, yeah, I think, you know, it's gotten... Uh, you know, thousands of ratings on Amazon, whereas the uh, book 10 years ago, uh, Country Hardball, the collection of short stories, I think probably has you know, probably under 100 reviews. Oh, okay. So, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's magnitudes of whatever. But, they, you know, Amazon is fantastic. And it's, it's Lake Union uh, yeah. imprint right. for Amazon Publishing, which is strange because I had uh, thought that it would be um, – uh, Thomas and Mercer, because they have a great track record for crime fiction, mm -hmm. mysteries and that sort of thing. But it was it was like Union. So uh, that would, seems to have worked out well because those people have been great to deal with. What was um, Allison Dasho uh, used to be Allison Jansen with uh, Bleak House and Tyrus Books and uh, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. And so right, right. Um, she was the editor there. She's moved on still within the company, uh, but doing other things. So it was great to get to work with her, um, you know, uh, for when the book came out. So for those that don't know, what is the sort of the elevator pitch? What is this book about? Well, the original title was Cottonmouth Tomlin and the Last Outlaw Camp. I like that title. The, I did too. I'm very fond of that. <laughs> that, gives, that gives away a, a, a good chunk of the of the story, I think, though. Well, I, but, yeah, and I think it sort of sets the tone for the book in terms of it's, you know, it's a it's a it's a bit of a romp. You know, there's mm -hmm. some darn so, uh, country hardball. The uh, book of short stories from 2013 uh, was pretty dark uh, and, and bleak. That was uh, came out on Tyrus. Uh, Simon and Schuster now owns it, um, the rights to it. Uh, but that was that was pretty dark. Uh, this one I was a lo lot. I thought of it as a lot, lot, lot more fun. Kidnappings, and bank robberies, and moonshines, and all those sorts of things. So we had I had a lot of fun with the car chases. Um, and so I thought the title Cottonmouth Tomlin and the Last Outlaw Camp kind of gave you a good feel. For the book, because yeah. mm -hmm. I grew up reading, um, you remember those books, um, like the uh, Indiana Jones uh, books, like Indiana Jones and the Lost Pyramid in Arizona, or that sort of stuff. You know, yeah. there's each one's a different adventure type. Yes, you know, well, like, uh, you know, so so they had like some fun sorts of things, like you know. So yeah. I wanted that kind of tone, but uh, as many books are sold by thumbnail, I know uh, <laughs> yeah. have. 17 word uh, title for your book <laughs> can be problematic. Uh, so anyway, so they went with uh, the county line. And of course, the idea there is um, there, it, uh, there are uh, lines that you don't cross. And mm -hmm. so to back to your question, uh, I've been going on 17 minutes, but the question you asked 17 minutes ago right, <laughs> was, uh, what's the book about? And it's about this outlaw camp in Columbia County in 1933. The idea being that outside of the county, you could do whatever crime you want. But once you cross the county line and come into the county, uh, you need to keep your nose clean. And if you do that, then the local people, the uh, the crime bosses, the law enforcement will just kind of let you uh, let you alone and uh, leave you alone, mm -hmm. uh, as educated people would say. And there are precedents for this in uh, like uh, uh, St. Paul back in the time, back in the day. Minnesota, they had they had tons of little uh, agreements with law enforcement up there and, you know, across the country in the 1930s, because they didn't mm -hmm. want people doing, you know, vile, crimey things in their county, but they right. did not mind their spending money there. So, yeah. you know, do the stuff out there. When you come in here, we'll keep you safe, but, you know, don't do anything here. So there's a lot of stuff going on out there. And of course, um, that's the line that gets, uh, spoiler alert, that's the line that gets <laughs> crossed. Um, you know, uh, as stuff starts kind of uh, cooking. So is that the, a little the, bit like uh, like a territorial thing then? They didn't want like outside crime coming into their area because they wanted to be like the crime bosses. Yeah, well, you know, in, in part territorial, but uh, from, you know, my research and uh, understanding of it all is they didn't want really any crime because they wanted to control. Right. They wanted it to be a nice county, even though it had people who had done bad things outside. You know, yeah. do, mm -hmm. do all you want over in Oklahoma. Or in Louisiana, but once you cross right. into Columbia County, Arkansas, uh, and, none and of that goes. And speaking if, if of research, be... since, since you mentioned it, um, are we going to, you know, if we happen to check your computer, is there going to be searches for kidnapping and bootlegging? Are you in trouble? <laughs> we did a lot. I was I was surprised at how, you know, we sort of hinted this in the book, at how there was a move right there about, you know, 32, 33, 34, a move away from bank robbing to kidnapping. 
And, you know, the, the Stroh's beer air, um, you know, I had, had Stroh's beer once, I think at a racetrack, um, first and last time ever having Stroh's beer. If you're a fan of Stroh's beer, <laughs> um, I, I don't know what to tell you. There are other beers out there. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so the heir of Stroh's beer, uh, the kid got kidnapped and, you know, ransomed off. And then other people were getting kidnapped. So they would they would kidnap banker sons and business people. And it was just, it was pretty rampant. And so the people who were doing the kidnapping, and I talk about this a little in the book, you know, the Mob Barker gang and that sort of thing, Creepy Carpus, they were kind of moving towards that that uh, kidnapping uh, as opposed to bank robbery. So when you're talking about, you know, the, the research on my computer, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> how to kidnap somebody and get away with it. Um, yeah. But of course, you know, if you how to kidnap somebody and get away with it, it doesn't make an interesting book. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, the research I did was more akin to, you know, how to uh, try to do a crime and really, really screw it up. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm going to get arrested for that. But that's, so you, I you have the one friend that he knows if there's anything ever happens to you, he needs to come over and wipe your. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the tattoo I have. Delete my yeah. browser history. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea of the, the Owl Camp, I thought that was interesting. And you said it was based off real stuff, that it was like a, a communal thing where all mm -hmm. these different people would come in all the time instead of just being, you know, it's Bonnie and Clyde's base that they go to and hide. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That no one would ever like rat each other out or whatever, you know, turn on each other. That the concept of that was just kind of really intriguing. Yeah, and it, it was it was interesting because there was one in um, I don't know how familiar y'all are with the geography of Louisiana, Arkansas, kind of that area. But my area is Northwest Arkansas, Southwest. I mean, uh, sorry, Southwest Arkansas, Northwest Louisiana. I'm doing this mm -hmm. as if you can see a map. <laughs> yeah, so got the fine. map pulled up. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, yeah bit, right here. Yeah, so over here, here and up this other yeah, the, road. The, yeah, yeah. So we have a storm front moving in here. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> And Vivian, Louisiana is a little south, probably it's a it's north of Shreveport, but south of the Arkansas line. So probably about 45 minutes, an hour into if you go from Arkansas down across the county line to Louisiana. So mm -hmm. there was a thing called Black Bayou down there and they had an outlaw camp there where, you know, you know, bank robbers and Bonnie and Clyde and, other, you know, people would really hide out and they would come to um a cabin on the banks of the bayou and kind of get ferried over like i mentioned in the book and so i stole all mm -hmm. kinds of stuff but most of the people <laughs> who were there uh you know they're violent but uh, my hope is that they're long dead and don't come after yeah. me because i thought that was pretty interesting and there are stories about how when they were at this camp you know they're outlaws and somebody robbed this bank and they should have robbed this bank and some of them you know were uh, stepping out with you know somebody else's woman and that sort of thing so there were a lot of tensions at the camp but of course you oh, weren't yeah. allowed to have a gun there you weren't allowed to have a knife there and they had yeah. to get along at the camp so you know that's that's the tension that makes these sorts of things interesting so the research and the finding out at the outlaw camp when i saw that i said no i gotta that's that i want that you know i want to write about that mm -hmm. What made you uh, what made you want to set this novel in the Great Depression era in the, the 19, 1930s? The uh well, it was such a fun time. I was gonna say um, he wanted to he wanted to shine some light on it and kind of yeah, yeah. Up some, you know. Oh, yeah, wanted to change history. That's what it yeah, was. I, I don't think anybody's ever heard of the Great Depression, so I kind of not, not at all. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, Country Hardball uh, takes place in that same area in the 2010, okay. you know, 2010s. And so I was curious in terms of the families, the Rudds and the Pribbles and the Tomlins and the Tallies and all the people, um, you know, my ancestors, as it were, um, and the families mm -hmm. that are in the book, you know, how they got there. And so kind of doing like a, a backstory. So I said, let's go back, you know, 80, 100 years or so and see, build those families. So the idea was that I would go back to uh, 1930s and then back to, you know, the uh, David Mitchell book, Cloud Atlas, how uh -huh. it goes back in time and then back in time and then comes back and then comes back. So I thought I would do that. I'd go back to the fifties and then go back to the thirties and then come back to the fifties, um, which was much more than uh, someone with my talent can handle. So, <laughs> uh, but what I did do was I peeled off the part of the story that took, takes place in the fifties. And that's what uh, Playboy magazine bought uh, for the 2015 uh, November issue. So I sold that, to, that part of it for Playboy. So that okay. worked out. And then the 1933 part, I turned into this book. I was, I was going to mention that because you're kind of one of those excuses. I read it for the articles, you know, so <laughs> thanks for contributing to that part. Uh, you, know, you, you, you might have saved a few guys around the, the country. So, yeah, you know, the the <laughs> slicks like, uh, you know, Playboy and Esquire and all those. I just I, I love the the fiction uh, that they've got in there. It's fantastic. Daniel Woodrell has like, I think, two yeah. 
of my favorite stories in the whole universe ran in Esquire. So anytime, you know, in the, the slick magazines run fiction, it's usually right. uh, fantastic right. stuff. And so I, I, I was very fortunate to get in there. Yeah, Stephen King. I think got Stephen King started. used to do stuff in Playboy and Esquire yeah. stuff too. Yeah. So was, was it a challenge to write it back, you know, hundred years ago? I saw on your uh, your website you had like a list of books that you read as I guess like oh, research yeah, yeah, yeah. for the novel. It was like 20, 20 books or something like that. Well, people ask why they take you ten freaking years to write a book. <laughs> and I, so I did all. I was going to rub dirt in, in that wound, but yeah. It yeah, well, no, you know, years. nobody, uh, I'm fortunate that nobody was knocking down my door for my next book. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Nobody said, oh my God, I can't get on with my life until I read another Steve Weddle book, right? <laughs> so I had all the time in the world that I wanted. And so I used it to kind of research some things. And of course, you know, you have stops and starts and there are a lot of little side things that I researched that would make, that it will make good future books. But yeah, I, I had mm-hmm. a great time and I did a lot of work on this book for uh the uh banana plantations the banana king the mm-hmm. um all that stuff down in honduras you know in the teens and the 20s and the 30s and the and the terrible horrible awful vile things that we did that our country did down there right and so i did a lot of research there and thought i would use that in uh this book but as i was editing and revising and things you know the um uh that part of the story kind of peeled away to borrow a banana <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. No I, I slipped on that one. Sorry. Um, and so that sort of cut that part out and kind of focused on sort of the kidnapping and the the robbing and the the uh, the drinking. Mm-hmm. Out, of, out of all the books that you you read for like research, like if someone's read this and they kind of want more, like was there like a companion book? Like, oh, you should read this. Jeff as... Gwynn did a lot of good Bonnie and Clyde kind of stuff. And so I uh-huh. stole a lot of the details there. There's a thing that in the early part of the book, there's a the motor court, the um, uh, uh, Everett and Beans and Jimmy uh, are yeah. at, uh, at a motor court. They're traveling and they're, they're stopped there. And so I, you know, I'd sort of seen when you're in the antique store and you're like going through the postcards and things and you kind of see little pictures, of these little motor courts from the 1930s. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't, you know. I'm not terribly right. I hadn't thought about what it was like in the 30s to drive across the country and stop at these little motor courts because you know, it wasn't quite the motel set, these little houses. So I was like, that's, right. that's pretty interesting. And so that whole motor court thing, I pulled from a lot of the old Bonnie and Clyde stuff. But, uh, you know, there were uh, there was some each little part of it. I would read three or four different books. And so, yeah, that, thanks for mentioning the list. That's at the website. So if you wanted mm-hmm. to go through there and you said this is the part, you know, I thought 80 percent of your book was crap but there was 20% that I'm interested in knowing a lot more about. Well, yeah. then you can read that sort of stuff. Cause there are people who obviously know a lot more than I do about that subject matter. So I, mm-hmm. I was fascinated by a lot of that. And the, you know, the, the music, you know, you, you get into the music um, of the area. Uh, Chris Harding Thornton, who wrote a fantastic book called little underworld recently is in the same sort of time period, although hers is in uh, Nebraska, you know, we've kind of bounced songs back and forth and, you know, it's nice to see that other people are listening to Ruth Edding or, or, you know, old 1930s, <laughs> singers and jazz and things like that. So a lot of the research wasn't just books, but it was also um, music as well. And then just going through eBay and finding old um, like farm magazines from the mm-hmm. 1930s and the advertisements. Um, so it was, uh, you know, if there, there wasn't really one book because it was like three books for every part of the yeah, book. Yeah. But that's why, you know, that's why I owe, that's why, that's why my credit card bill to eBay is probably about uh, $7,800. So. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. You mentioned, yeah. Don't tell. Me. So she's not watching, right? No, <laughs> no. definitely yeah, not. No, she. Yeah, believe, believe me. She and I talk about the books on the things all the time. So uh, she, she, she's aware of my nonsense. So you were you mentioned like the banana man and stuff. What's his name? Uh, Sam Z, Z Murray, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so banana man Sam. I- He's the Chiquita banana and all that kind of stuff. That, you know, they would go down and take over the um, take over the area and say, "We'll we'll build railroads for you." We'll, we'll take care of mm-hmm. all that for you if you give us the land rights. And so, of course, they would build a banana. But the people down there would like, oh, good, we got jobs. We're building train railroads through here. This is great. And then, of course, they they kill the people, burn the people, um, burn the land, put the railroads through there, and then plant the banana plantations. But I stepped on your question, so um, I'll go ahead. Go ahead, caller. I was gonna say, you know, in the book, I just thought it was something you'd made up. And then afterwards, I was doing my research for the show, which Jay doesn't know about that, but I do research for the show. And he's never, so he's he was, never done research for the show. He was a, yeah, look, I've got questions, Jay. I'm a professional. But then he was, a, I read his Wikipedia article. He's a real person. So I was wondering, you know, what, and that's kind of like Cotton's backstory before he comes back to, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the county. So was that just something you, 
you saw like, oh, that would be interesting to for that to be his backstory, or like, how did the the banana yeah, well, man was, of Honduras and all that stuff come yeah. to be? Um, pro, uh, a couple of things. One is as as readers and writers and things, you know, you bump up against stuff all the time, and you kind of save things and say someday I'm going to use that sort of stuff. So I was fortunate that you know some things stuck in my mind. But if you're writing about the 1930s. I needed somebody who had, uh, needed, as I'm building the character, because what mm -hmm. I do is character based. I mean, the, you know, there's there's plot driven stuff, there's character stuff, but I'm really interested in the character and the, the development of the character. So I needed somebody who kind of had some um, uh, uh, war experience. And I didn't want mm -hmm. something as obvious as World War One. I. Okay. I didn't want, um, you know, uh, Spanish American War was kind of a wrong timing. So I wanted something um, really kind of evil. You know, um, something bad and something uh, uh, kind of uh, something nasty, I suppose. Um, and so like a World War One vet, you've got somebody who, you know, there's valor in that, you know, fighting for the country and that sort of thing. If you're if you're down there, you know, just absolutely pillaging and destroying and things like that, um, the uh, did to Honduras. Uh, you know, I think that that's a different type of backstory. And so I wanted the war mm -hmm. and I wanted kind of the darker sort of backstory because, but I also didn't want one of the things, the, the, this world needs many, many, many things. What it does not need is another story about the redemption of a white man, you know? Oh, yeah. um, so I, I did not want to write a, a redemption story. Um, so I didn't want him having done bad things and then coming back and then doing something good. So I mm -hmm. was fortunate that I could just have him keep doing bad things. You know? <laughs> uh, so the, uh, the, the, you know, the banana man story I think was great because it also showed uh, you know, if you read about, you know, Sam, Banana Man Sam, mm -hmm. and you read about, you know, you read the book, then you know that Cottonmouth um, in the book is obsessed with this idea of being a cog in the machine, you know, mm -hmm. working for the rich people. And so he's kind of he's kind of reaching for that, but he also kind of dislikes it. Uh, so he kind of wants to be as successful as the Banana Man, but he also sort of leaves, um, you know, um, I, I don't know what a clever way to say a bad taste in his mouth. But whatever the clever way to say, if you guys could afterwards uh, in post, could you dub in? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll dub that over. Yeah. <laughs> it, it but anyway, it leaves a bad taste. Yeah. So so there's sort of that struggle and the conflict and things like that. So that's that's sort of what I was playing with um, mm -hmm. in the character of Cottonmouth and then the background in Honduras as well. And to me, it, and it kind of comes across that he, he's because he went down to Honduras and, and it's like the people knew the bad things happened down there mm -hmm. and he came back. They kind of looked at him as the like anti-hero, you know. They're they're looking up to him because they know what he's capable of, mm -hmm. but then they know he had to go down and do some stuff. But they don't really talk about it so much. Right. So, I mean, it, it does come across because I mean, normally when you read, like you said, like you mentioned just a second ago, when you read about someone coming home from World War One or two or whatever, they're like the hero, you know. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah. they fought for their country. He's coming from a different kind of fight, you know. But they're still kind of looking up to him because they know. You know, during that time, the, the, the crime people were kind of like heroes to the local people in a way. So, yeah, it was kind of like a little anti-hero to me, the way I, the way I was I was taking it in. So. Yeah, nobody's nobody's throwing a parade for the yeah. people who came back from Honduras mm -hmm. like that, what, they, what we did there. So I, I got a dog down here, so if you see me. Uh, oh, that's fine. Dog like that. <laughs> We've all got dogs. Mine are probably laying right outside the door. <laughs> but you, it's interesting you said that you didn't want to have like a redemption for Cottonmouth. So I was going to ask, you know, he since he is like a bad guy and throughout the story, he continues to do bad things, unsavory things. Was that hard to make him sort of your protagonist and have it be where the audience reading the book sort of is rooting for him in a way? You're rooting for the bad guy? Yeah. You know, in the, in like a horror movie when, you know, you're rooting for the person to survive and then they're like, oh, I'm going to go, let's split up and I'll go over here and I'll look at what's going on there. And you're like, no, don't do that. Yeah. You, know? you idiot. So, yeah. Right. So what I want is to put Cottonmouth in a situation where the reader can kind of say, don't do that, you know? And then because mm -hmm. of his character, because he's just on that traje trajectory, um, said the lisping ginger trajectory, <laughs> um, you know, that that's what, that's what he's going to do. I did a lot of that. I had a lot of fun with that in uh, country hardball with Roy Allison. It was always, mm -hmm. you know, you're faced with the right thing to do. There's the um, uh, Bob Dylan line in Brownsville Girl, my favorite Dylan song, where he says people don't always do what they believe in. They just do what's mm -hmm. most convenient and repent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I, I you know, I, I, I'm always thinking about sort of that sort of thing. And then, you know, so, you know, you get the Bob Dylan thing. And of course, the uh, the whole reason to write um, the uh, the county line was because I wanted to write a story that Emmylou Harris would sing background on. 
you know? So I wanted <laughs> to get kind of that character and that flavor and that kind of epic sort of, uh, you know, uh, difficult, fragile um, undertone going through there. Mm -hmm. But then also that, that bleakness. I, I don't I don't do heroes, but I do people who are uh, capable of heroic things, but they they uh, they sometimes reach for that and they see it within their grasp. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, what's the Browning line, a man's reach to exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for. So they can yeah. dream of doing better, but they're, they ain't, they ain't going to do better. Yeah, and even everything that he tries to, I guess you would maybe maybe say heroic, it's all sort of out of greed. He's wanting to you know, get money and step up and not be a cog in the yeah. machine anymore. It's going to be the be the boss of the situation. Well, he starts off, so, you know, you're, you're mentioning he goes to Honduras, but, you know, he comes back with a lot of pride. You know, and mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, I, I, I've come back. I have to take over my uncle's farm because he comes back to the outlaw camp because his uncle has passed away. I guess um, if you guys want to pick this up and put this in the first 30 seconds so people know what the hell the book's about. <laughs> that's great. But anyway, this this would have been a great answer to your earlier question um, an hour and a half ago. When you yeah. what the hell's the book yeah. about. Um, so, yeah, so he gets he's in Honduras and he gets the uh, uh, telegram that his uncle has passed away and he needs to come take over the uh, uh county business the family business which is the outlaw camp and he comes back and he says well my uncle was kind of running this into the ground i'm mm -hmm. super smart i'm clever um i've got all this worldly experience so much better than these dummies in columbia county i'm going to fix things and so he sort of fights against that and then about a third of the way book uh, more, third of the way through the book you know the the catalyst the ensuing incident and all that kind of uh index card stuff he sort of gets uh -huh. pushed to this and he says all right well here we go let's go i'm gonna i'm gonna fix this and the first or second page of the book he's faced with somebody driving a car a local person he doesn't know the name and you know almost kills the guy for a very small uh degree. It's just because he's not connected to the community and as things go uh -huh. over i wanted him to uh, you know, fight with that. And the idea being, can he connect with the community? So as the, you know, again, spoiler alert, but as the book goes on, the, the question of whether he knows people's names is a little piece of color or tone going through the book to see, you know, how, how that's, that's an indicator of whether he's connecting with the people as it moves on. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you said he was proud of himself. Like he was doing, he was, I think he was talking to like the, the grocery store guy. I can't remember his name. Moon. But he was, Moon, yeah, he was talking about, um, you know, I was fighting for my country down there in Honduras. He, he yeah. mentioned that, so he was kind of proud of that. Well, even though it yeah, wasn't he, he was really, like, yeah, he was, he was, you know, he was, he was fighting. They, they weren't making money. Yeah, and by the way, Moon, I don't know if you ever read Tom Stoppard's only novel, Lord Malquis and Mister Moon. I read in college, and I said one of these days mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a character called Moon. And <laughs> here we are. So yeah, so uh, so uh, Cottonmouth is kind of uh, fighting, struggling with kind of his his placement there about what he was doing in Honduras, which mm -hmm. of course people who he talks to. You know, they keep their their uh, running joke throughout the book is, you know, when you were down in Mexico or when you were down in Cuba or whatever, yeah. you know, it's, it's Honduras. And so that's kind of the because they're not really connecting with him either it's, as it goes through. So, yeah, that was, um, uh, I think, an interesting part of his backstory. Uh, I mean, interesting to me in terms to play with it. It's up to the reader whether it turns out to be interesting, I guess. But to me, it was interesting to play with those sort of uh, background, uh, the army thing, but not the army. Yeah. Was it was it fun to play in this time period where, like Jay mentioned earlier, like the outlaws and gangsters, they were like, you know, celebrities or folk heroes back then. You know, you have Al Capone and Bonnie and Clyde and Babyface Nelson and all these guys. Was it fun to sort of play in that same realm as? Yeah, they as were these guys. You, yeah, it, it was, and you know, you have to be careful that you don't um, kind of look back with sort of this history. <laughs> Uh, channel rose colored glasses kind of thing where they did some bad things and they weren't yeah. heroes to everybody. I mean, we look back and we go, Oh, Butch Cassidy and Sundance kid, weren't they fun? You know, we have yeah. this kind of, <laughs> we have this idea, I think now of looking back as if they were all Robin hoods, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of them weren't Robin hoods. They were just Robin, you know, uh, they were robbing this person, robbing that person. And so the idea of they're not going to rob from the poor people, um, I think, uh, you know, uh, is something that's, um, uh, uh, to borrow a phrase from the end of a Hemingway book, isn't it pretty to think so? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a, it's a nice story. It doesn't, doesn't always check out with the facts, but it was fun to play with those gangsters because, you know, they, you know, they uh, sort of uh, um, mess around with some of the ideas there. And so I, I did have a lot of fun. The short answer to your question. Yes. I, I had a lot of fun messing around with the uh, gangsters. <laughs> so I think it was, I can't remember who said it, but it was Everett or Jimmy, the kind of like the bumbling robbers, I guess you could say. They, I think one of them were talking about like uh, knocking off like the uh, the payroll place or something like that. I was like, yeah. why would you do that when they've worked for yeah. you know yeah, yeah, yeah. two weeks for yeah. their pay and then 
then they're not going to get paid at the end of the week. Why would you right. why would you rob that instead of kidnapping the big banker who's rich anyway and getting Yeah, I mean, of course, the idea is, so, you know, kidnap a banker. And then the idea is, well, who would want to pay to get a banker back? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, those sorts of things. But, yeah, the, the payroll thing, you know, it, uh, you also, I, you know, I try looking at um, a lot of those uh, kind of putting a real person in that situation. You know, mm-hmm. I try, and I, you know, the, the books that I like, um, they're, they're writing about uh, people, not characters. So whenever I'm creating a character, I try to make sure that I am creating a person. So, you know, mm-hmm. you think, well, if, if this person lines up and then of course, sometimes the person is going to do things or the person in the book is going to do things that you don't agree with because it's in line with their character. So uh, some of that is sort of difficult. It's like if you're uh, in a role playing game and you're playing somebody whose alignment is different than yours. Well, yeah. I wouldn't do this, but my character in the game is going to have to set fire to the orphanage, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're the, speaking Mark, of Jimmy and go ahead, Jay. No, I was I was going to say cause I'm always curious from where some of the uh, the names came from. Cottonmouth. Yeah, I, lo- I mean, cause I, I know you did some research, but I mean, were these some of the names that you saw when you were doing your research yeah cotton cottonmouth was like Jimmy the, the hook the third <laughs> the third cottonmouth was, was his third name i think um the uh w- one of the problems i ran into i'd called him fed because uh my great great uncle was fed tomlin um mm-hmm. and so um yeah i thought fed would be a great name but then as i'm writing you know the the dialogue and everything it's like um you better take a step back fed said I was like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't do fed sick, right, right? Dr. Seuss. So, I mean, come on. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, one gun, two gun, red gun, blue gun. So I thought, you know, I probably couldn't, could, couldn't do that. So yeah. So cotton. So I was trying to think of something, something tough, uh, but also something that it, once you learn the secret, and I never got to this because I talked about later in the book and I don't want to give any spoilers, but there's a, there's a name in the book um, where you find out what the name really means of a person. Right. Um, but for Cottonmouth, what it was going to be. And like I said, I, I didn't use it in the book cause you can't, you know, didn't want to go use the same joke twice. Um, they think it's a tough name, but in fact, um, when he was a child, you know, uh, he, and, and breast, he was having trouble breastfeeding. You know, and so he kind of got the nickname Cottonmouth because it was thirsty and he wasn't being able to wasn't being able to feed. He was having <laughs> having all these difficulties. He was a very very weak child, and they thought he was going to die. So they kept talking about Cottonmouth, and I thought, oh, that's funny because you think he's tough, but you hear the stories. So so I like that sort of conflict and that tension, sort of the uh, unexpectedness of it. But I used the joke somewhere else, so I couldn't do that. It's a very un ungangster name. For, yeah, Jimmy. For, you know, J- Jimmy the Hook. There was a there was a character that I ran across called um like um uh. uh Deaf Dwayne or something like that. And I thought that'd be good. And I thought, well, I don't want to, you know, that's ableist. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. like, I'm, I'm like, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to lean into that, but they, people have these names. Um, and, uh, you know, Jimmy the hook, it, I thought was funny because, you know, he hurts his arm early in the, in right. the book. And so, mm-hmm. you know, his nickname sort of, uh, the, uh, the reality follows the naming of him, I suppose. So yeah. it, it worked out well, but yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the names come from things. And of course I got, um, Somewhere I have a, a family book. Oh, here I have a family book. It's show and tell. Sorry, guys. So I have That's this good. book. You, you, you brought some props. So this is um, my family history, genealogy. And so um, I use a lot of uh, stuff from here. And so what this gives you is, um, well, it gives you it gives you pictures of uh, you know great grandma and great grandpa. But it's also one of these where it gives you all the names of the family and oh, okay. you know. Who, That's cool. uh, you know, Matthew begat Malachi, all that kind of stuff from the Bible. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I go through here and make a chart of cool first names and then last names and mix them up and just take one from column A and then something else from column B. So I end up with a lot of uh, uh, what I what I think are, are cool, fun names. And then, of I mean, course, they're, they're, um, they're fitting for the time because you don't want to read a. Uh, a book, an historical fiction book about the depression and have someone named uh, Braden. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> Braden or, or Brad or, uh, <laughs> yeah, nothing know, against the that. Bradens of the world. You know, to all the Bradens <laughs> who have tuned like in, you're very, very good looking. Thank you. You know, um, that came out last year or something, you know? Yeah. Just right. Yeah. And then of course, out of the story. So, and then of course, I think something like 20% of the names are stolen from friends of mine. So I tried to sneak in a lot of friends names. As well, because that's uh, that's you know one of the main reasons to write a book is to get your friends' names in there. Mm-hmm. So you said Tomlin was your uncle's last name. So are these characters based off family members in any way? Uh, uh, my according to my, my attorney, the answer is no. No, <laughs> nobody is based on anybody. Oh, they're all reason. fiction. All made up. 
Oh, there's, made there's, up. There's, there's no Henrietta in your in your uh, family anywhere. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, Rudd you know, sisters. Henrietta, the Rudd sisters weren't even in the first draft of this book. Really? I really hated. I really hated the Rudd sisters. Just so you know, I didn't like them at all. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Yeah, I, I've had a lot of people. I've uh, you know uh, uh, mixed in with all of the emails. Um, telling me the things that I got wrong in the book are emails telling me, you know, when's the Red Sisters spinoff coming? You know, yeah, yeah. Asking <laughs> those sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, the Red, you know, the Red Sisters, they were a surprise. They were, they were not in the early draft of the book. So, um, I thought that they were, I, I had a lot of fun with them. They were probably, uh, some of the most fun characters that I had writing. Well, the that's Red interesting that the you, origin, <laughs> the yeah. origin story. So yeah, was they, the was the first draft was it completely different because they play a pretty significant role in the, they in do. the story. Yeah, the first draft and so what happened in I talked about the bigger one going back to the fifties going back to the thirties. So um, mm-hmm. a, a guy Cottonmouth knew from Honduras comes to visit him because he's on a hunt for Confederate gold and needs some help with this. And so there was a lot of that going through there. And so I had Cottonmouth with the outlaw camp and the kidnapping and you know you can't do anything. And then uh, his friend comes in and wants him to do, help him with this. So those worlds are kind of colliding. And the sheriff played a bigger role um, in terms mm-hmm. of being like the heavy, you know. And then I thought, yeah. gosh, how, you know, this is, um, you know, this this book is pretty much getting to be a sausage fest, you know. And <laughs> that's not the way that history is. That's certainly not the way my family history is because, you know, we've, we've mm-hmm. got, you know, we, you read about stuff and there's, you know, um, women and men doing all kinds of things. So I it was like, you know, it, we're going to have some badass women in here. And so the Red Sisters just kind of um, essentially like came to the window and they're like, dude, <laughs> we're, we can take care of this for you. And, you know, they just kind of Henrietta Rudd, you know, being so tough and Abigail Rudd being a lush. Oh, my gosh. I had, I had so much fun with that. And then they, you know, their own backstory about going up to Memphis and then how they got there. And so that was that was a lot of fun because in the in the 1950s part of it, the part that's in Playboy magazine, Franklin Rudd is in that one. And he's the guy um, who supposedly killed the grandfather of the main character of Country Hardball. So we're going back there. So we have Rudd's there. And I thought, well, let's see how the Rudd's, uh, you know, how what came before. Uh, yeah. Nobody, you know, nobody gets mad at you when you write a prequel um, in the same way that they get mad when you write a sequel. Because mm-hmm. in a sequel, people say, you know, well, that shouldn't happen this. And I hate what you did with so and so. And but in a prequel, when you're making up new people, nobody's going to say, oh, I hate what, because it's all new. Right. Even though yeah. it's, it's a precursor. So um, I, I prefer not to be in trouble if I can help it. You know, <laughs> my, my track record as a human person probably, uh, you know, goes against that. But um, I my idea is I would prefer not to be in trouble if I can help it. I like that the Red Sisters backstory had to do with the Piggly Wiggly because I always oh. thought that was a hilarious name oh, oh. for a grocery store growing up. That always yeah, cracked oh. me up every single time. Down to Absolutely. the Piggly Wiggly, get a bottle the Piggly pop. Wiggly. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh God, yeah, I can't. You know, one of the highlights of my childhood was my father going down to the Piggly Wiggly on Sundays and coming back with uh, donuts. You know, yeah, it's fantastic. An apple nice. fritter from Piggly Wiggly. Oh my God, you can't beat that. It, does the Piggly Wiggly does it even exist anymore? Is it all gone? Yeah, they have. We were in, uh, my wife and I were in uh, Old Fort, North Carolina last week, and they have a Piggly Wiggly. Um, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, it's a, I, I found out after we had booked the vacation, after we had booked the vacation, uh, it's a dry county. Uh, oh, no. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had, we, we had discussed with the, uh, the kind people at Piggly Wiggly who explained things to us. So, uh, yeah, but they do, they do have a Piggly Wiggly. There's no, there's no beer there, but they have a Piggly Wiggly. So I wanted to ask about, uh, go ahead, Jay, while I'm reading my no, question. I was going to bring up to North Carolina. He was talking about backstage. If he wanted to talk about his little writer's retreat that he did, or as uh, no social media, no electronics oh, yeah. thing. Because, I mean, yeah. you know, most people would go, would go ape shit crazy. But <laughs> was it something you did? Were you, were you writing a new story? No, I was, I was finishing. Um, yeah, I mentioned the uh, Cottonmouth's friend coming um, and hunting for the Confederate gold. Uh, mm-hmm. so that's the sequel to this one. It takes place in 1938. So I wanted to get that okay. one finished. So my wife and I rented a cabin in the woods, uh, uh just North, uh, on the mountain, just North of, uh, well, I mean, you know, North Carolina, they call the mountains. So yeah. I will call mm-hmm. them the mountains, um, just North of old fort and North Carolina, which is a little East Northeast of Asheville you know, for those of you uh, scoring at home. Uh, or, or those of you by yourselves. So just northeast of Asheville um, is where we were saying. And so my wife is a visual artist, does fantastic work. 
um, works, uh, also does commission work, HelenWeddle.com. And so <laughs> she, she had some projects to work on and I wanted to work on my book. And, um, uh, so we went down there and spent a week. Uh, there was no cell phone service at the cabin, no dish TV, direct TV, no TV. Um, there was no, uh, obviously no internet, no Wi-Fi, that sort of thing. So we got up every morning and, and we each worked on our projects and it was fantastic. Um, I had told, um, I told my editor uh, before I was leaving, hey, look, I'm going to be, you know, gone for a week. I'm going to be working on this book. So, you know, a couple of days after I came back, he says, hey, where the hell's the book? <laughs> you know? yeah. So, um, so that thing, was, it's done. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's how that's that works. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, I worked on it. I printed it out. So it's got some, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to read it, but there you go. If you want to slow that down. Oh, yeah, spoiler alert. There yeah. you go. But, you, so, you yeah, know, like yeah. horror movies start out that way. Let's just go oh, rent a cabin. Yeah. No kind of, uh, no, no, no cell service, no cell service, no phone, no, no electric, you know, you got to go out to the outhouse and yeah, well, I, you know, I, I was worried about that. Uh, my wife uh, is taking kickboxing, so I was well protected. Oh, you're good. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, you go. I am unbelievably fragile. I mean, I mean, looking at me, you would believe it, but I'm saying, you know, as a, as a crime fiction author, you're supposed to be tough and, you know, ride motorcycles and, you know, uh, <laughs> Uh, drink drink a gallon of whiskey a week or whatever, but I'm I'm very very fragile and break easily and cry a lot. So uh, I was glad to have my <laughs> wife there to protect me. So speaking of the the sequel you've been writing, is that or are you excited to re-enter the world of Cottonmouth and, and y- yeah? And write, so write about him um, again. Yeah, one of the things that I found was I I had told a lot of the Cottonmouth story that I wanted to tell with this one, and mm-hmm. so in in this next one. Um, I'm, I'm looking at using Cottonmouth as kind of a secondary sort of character to kind of push some things along. Um, okay. Cottonmouth is um, in, involved with a young woman who is um, uh, the preacher's daughter and the preacher oh. and um, the uh, uh, Cottonmouth's friend work together uh, to hunt for treasure, kind of the gold, mm-hmm. buried gold, because Cottonmouth's friend, of course, from Honduras is kind of a um, he's based on uh, uh, Lee Christmas. Um, real, real guy who was a uh, who was down in Honduras. So if you you, know, you Google Lee Christmas, I think it was in a um, um, one of those Expendables movies. I think there was a character back. I could be wrong. I'm not really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, movie uh, uh, but anyway, so sort of. So he's called LC in the book. I don't know what he's gonna be called when the book comes out, but in the in what I've got, he's called LC. And so he comes wanting Cottonmouth to help him. And Cottonmouth says, uh, "Well, how can I help you?" And it turns out all the clues for this are in Bible verses and biblical verses and codes and things okay. like that. That's the code that they use. And that's based on real stuff that really 100% exists in Arkansas. Um, okay. and so I sort of pulled all of that sort of uh, out of there. So the, the preacher is trying to get money to build a church. The daughter is trying to get money to feed people because we're still in the 1930s and it was tough. Mm-hmm. And Cottonmouth mm-hmm. sends his friend to talk to the preacher, which kind of gets things rolling um and everybody gets into conflict with everybody and uh it's uh of course we're, you know we're off and running uh yeah, and so yeah. I, I had a lot of fun kind of tying all that sort of stuff up over the past uh, couple of weeks so i'm a sucker for a treasure hunt story like that so that sounds uh, right up my alley. i was and um you know uh i don't know if you know nelson demille but uh my wife's from mm-hmm. Long island so we've read a lot of nelson mill stuff and uh there's a book that he's got uh, that turns out to be searching for uh, pirate treasure, which you don't know until you're well into the book. You know, I got like 250 yeah. pages in the book. I'm like, sweetie, if this book's about pirate treasure, we got trouble. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> want to read some pirate treasure book set in a long island. Um, it was a lot of fun, of course. Uh, anyway, so uh, I've, I'm trying to be very cognizant of sort of the pirate treasure trope you know, the hidden mm-hmm. treasure sort of thing. So, um, again, when you, when you're, when you're Turns writing something like that, out of nowhere. Oh God. Yes. Um, <laughs> hey, when you're straight. writing something like that, um, you know, you, you could kind of play with the tropes and because people come with expectations. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when, when people expect things, you can pull the rug out from under them. So, uh, I well, you've already twisted it. a little bit with it being Confederate gold and you got the Bible verses as a clue. See that, that yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah. And, and again, there's, you know, the, you can, you can Google that stuff up. It really exists in the real world. So it's, mm-hmm. uh, I just steal everything from the real world. And, and <laughs> that's you know, the I, best thing to steal it from. It's, it's so interesting so, to me, at least. It's a lot easier to steal the ideas and make them up yourself. Right. Well, you know, the, um, uh, it seems like every couple of days, well, you know, uh, Chris Holm, every couple of days or so, one of us is sending the other of us like some weird stuff that we found on the internet. Like, oh my God, did you know this? <laughs> you know, did you, did you guys, so there's, you know, so the uh, 700,000 word Wikipedia article about some crazy <laughs> conspiracy thing that happened in the 1700s in, you know, Germany. And you're like, I had no idea this was happening. So 
the, yeah. that's how you st- keep it in the uh, historical fiction uh, category because people love it. I mean, yeah. it's, it's real mm-hmm. stuff, and you're making a twist on it. So, yeah, you're bringing it to life, as the cliche goes. There you go. So I want to ask with this uh, novel, it felt like one of the through lines with you know, Cottonmouth and the Reds, and even some of the like maybe kind of the grocery store guy and stuff. Uh, moon like the idea of like uh, legacy and like family legacy and sort of honoring your family what came before and yeah. you know things like that so was that important to you to sort of have that through line w- between all these different characters this kind of legacy of family and upholding that throughout the absolutely book? and you know and, and i think that in that in that area in that community on a lot of communities mm-hmm. you know the uh the idea of the outside pressures you know, you have to kind of, uh, you know, bring things in and protect yourselves and protect your family as you have the outside external threats. And so particularly in that time, of course, in the 1930s with the Depression, you had a lot of things going on that were threatening the families, whether it be the farm or, you know, Roosevelt with his damn, you know, new laws <laughs> that he's putting in advance. Yeah, I, you know, taking the gold. Uh, oh, my God, the gold. Yeah, absolutely. Because God forbid, you, you know, people should ha- own gold. So you got the government mm-hmm. coming in. You know, my uh, the stories are that my, you know, my family back there um, uh, were very uh, concerned with uh, some of the things the government was doing, coming yeah. in and, and, and uh, you know, taxing the land and taking some of their possessions and things. So when you do that, uh, you know, you you kind of uh, you have that kind of bunker mentality, I think, as a family. And there's a speech that um, Henrietta Rudd gives to Cottonmouth Tomlin, you know, when he's mm-hmm. talking about, you know, fighting for the country or, you know, working the country and things like that. And she says, uh, a country ain't never done a damn thing for me. You know, the mm-hmm. only the people who have who have saved your tail, Cottonmouth Tomlin, have been family and friends and right. this community coming. You know, when your when your mama ran off with that magic potion salesman, when your father ran off chasing her, you know, all these sort of, you know, and when it was just you and your, they came and they fed you the community. The government never did that, you know? Mm-hmm. So the community is the key thing. And of course there are, you know, families feuding with families, sort of that, uh, the uh, trope of kind of Hatfield McCoy sort of things like, Oh my yeah. God, he's a this and he's a that. So I had a lot of fun kind of creating these uh, different families, like, because you want, uh, again, this is all, I, I don't, I don't think I, I honestly, um, I don't think I know any Rudd, Pribble, t- you know, those sort of, anybody from that time or anything. So I had to kind of create all this sort of stuff based on the names. And so the Pribbles are a certain type of family, you know, and you mm-hmm. kind of expect this sort of thing. And, you know, I, I had to use that name because of the Star Trek Trouble with Tribbles, you know. I wanted sort of this <laughs> kind of running thing. Well, that's the Trouble with Pribbles. But, you know, I can't say that in the book, but I know that's in the margin, yeah. you know, the Trouble with Pribbles. And so the Rudds are the tough ones kind of taking it. So you've got all these different competing families, but, you mm-hmm. know, the, the community and the county, they have to stick up for each other. It's like somebody, you know, you may poke fun at your brother or your sister or somebody like that, but somebody comes from outside and they want to try that. You're going to knock their block off, you know? Yeah. And so it's that sort of thing, the outsider, the insider and the family and community ran all through country hardball. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's sort of, so that's something that I'm kind of uh, keen on thinking about and exploring as we go through, because I, I just find that, you know, I grew up in the South, um, but you've got community everywhere. You know, mm-hmm. I'm sure family, and t- you know, Idaho, Kentucky, you know, Illinois, Florida, whatever. So uh, but to me, it's very uh, tied to the place in terms of yeah. community and family and that sort of thing. Especially the time as well, because I feel like it's not the same community is not the same now as it was you know, back then. Yeah. And then, and then you run into the sort of thing as well in uh, sort of the anti-government sort of thing. You know, there's a lot of that back in the thirties, the, the government kind of getting over its skis, so to speak, and coming in and taking the gold, for example, or, you know, mm-hmm. Roosevelt's new deal um, sort of thing. And, you know, everybody in the book, um, whenever they mention Roosevelt's name, they spit, right. Yeah. So, and they call the, uh, they call the outhouse, the Roosevelt room. Right. Uh-huh. So that, so, you know, because, you know, the stories are, uh, you know, uh, my family and others weren't too keen on what the, the, the federal government was doing to the local stuff. You still get, as you know, you know, a lot of that, particularly in small community, farm communities, tight knit communities, um, sort of yeah. this uh, uh, antipathy towards the government coming in and telling you what to do. I don't, I don't know that anybody's fond of having other people tell them what to do, but it's particularly exactly. you know, uh, noticeable in uh, smaller, uh, more rural communities, I think. But that's been my experience. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I can't speak to urban communities like that or big, big cities. You know, you can tell me that, you know, the uh, everybody in Chicago feels the same way and I take a word for it. 
<laughs> and even like the the Ruds, even though they sort of their intentions are more greedy, you know, they're still looking out for the community. Like they, she went to like the uh, the farm auction. Got the auction. Like so of- yeah. So that so that scene. Um, that's one of those sort of standalone sort of things that when you mm-hmm. are writing the book, you know, that's a, that for me as a creator, that's sort of a tone scene and that's a character scene. So I bump mm-hmm. up against that. Um, for those, um, you know, uh, 87 billion people who have not read the book, there's a scene in the book <laughs> where uh, Henrietta Rudd goes, to, and this, this of course is based on, you know, the real things that happen and this sort of yeah. thing. I read about this. So probably in like a historical magazine or something where people would go, they would have an auction. The bank would come and auction off a farm and uh, the local community would come in and they would say, Oh hell no. And they would bid like a dollar on stuff and yeah. then the bank would be screwed and the farmer would get to keep his farm. And I was like, Oh my God, that's so beautiful. You know, this is the sort of thing yeah. I, as yeah. I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm fragile, but just telling you about that just sort of <laughs> makes me want to cry, you know, cause it's just so nice and it's such a community thing. It's so beautiful. So I'm like, Oh my God, I got, I got to, I got to steal that. Right. <laughs> cause, yeah. cause I'm nothing if not a thief. So, you know, I want it in Henrietta, but then of course I had to get the Henrietta red twist where she's still a little, uh, she's still a little Henrietta about it towards the end of that scene. So, yeah. you know, she's a little um, snide and snarky and a little mean spirited as well. So, but I wanted that in there. But that's the sort of scene where, in terms of plot, you know, it doesn't necessarily move the plot forward. Mm-hmm. Um, but I heard, a, I heard a good thing um, from I'm in, uh, uh, pals with the Five AM Writers Club group. It's a fantastic group, uh, which uh, I don't know if you uh, understand, but they write at uh, Five AM. So the 5 a.m. Writers Club. Sounds uh, terrible. (laughs) So uh, the 5 a.m. Writers Club, the aptly named 5 a.m. Writers Club, um, I I believe it was uh, uh, was Ralph Walker, said that, uh, you know, he had heard somebody mention, you know, you don't always want to move the plot forward, but you want to move the reader forward. So Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, you know, I can use that as cover to do what I want to do. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, so if anybody asks, yeah, I know it doesn't move the plot, but that's the reason. So to me, I want to do, when I'm writing a book, I, I want to do some tones and some characters and some things like that throughout, but I have to be careful because I could spend 300, you know, pages and not get anywhere, you know? Mm-hmm. And the, the last thing you want to do um, if you're trying to sell books is be pigeonholed as literary fiction, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? And so, uh, so I was like, I, you know, I got, I got to keep that plot moving. But I was fortunate that the story that sort of presented itself with the kidnapping and that sort of thing, um, mm-hmm. bank robberies, kidnappings, and shootings, it was great. So, you know, every so often, uh, you know, you need the uh, the man coming through the door with a gun, right? So I, I try to make sure that every every so often I'm like, okay, well, this is. This is all very self-indulgent, self-indulgent, Weddell. Let's get back to moving the stuff forward. So uh, yeah. uh, I appreciate your thinking of that scene because I love talking about Henrietta Rudd because I just had so much fun with her. And I think that she is a complicated in that she is helpful to the community, but she's also uh, uh, not always nice. I mean, she's, you know, she's, she's, not, she's very selfish, she's selfish. Yeah, she's selfish and, and in many ways selfless in that she sort of wants to help the community, but in ways that yeah. it helps her. So it, it yeah, it benefits her too. Yeah, me. yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't move it forward, but it, I, I think it's a great tone setting situation because you don't get that these days. You know, the, some of the stuff she did, but there was a piece of the thing she did was for the town, you know, and, and yeah. try to keep everything there. But of, of course, you know, like, like we've said, but like we've been talking all night, there's selfish reasons, reasons there, it, 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 you know, nowadays you have people flat out giving you their selfish reasons up front. So, oh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. And, that, 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 yeah and, and we applaud that, I suppose, when people yeah, are, so. are out for themselves, because I, some people aspire to that and say, yeah, you get it when you can. You know, right. you, you should do that. You should be rich. You should be a billionaire, that sort of thing. But uh, that really wasn't uh, what was going on then. Uh, uh, you know, maybe the banana man uh, that mm-hmm. uh, we were mentioning earlier that uh, uh, Cottonmouth has trouble thinking about, you know, the cog in the wheel. And, you know, there's the line in there uh, where they're talking about, you know, being the cog in the system and working and that sort of thing. And Moon's talking right. about that when they're playing poker and, you know, the cog. And so, uh, you know, um, then the, you want to think about the cog. And, you know, I think Moon maybe says, you know, who, who gives a shit about the cog? Right. And yeah. uh, Cottonmouth says, well, the cog, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> speaking, speaking from the point of view of the cog, uh, you know, I care. So, you know, it, it, the machine is important, um, of course, but, you know, from, from my point of view and what I want to write about is uh, more of the cogs, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And like that scene with Henrietta, it's, 
is it more for to keep the outsiders out of the community or more to actually, you know, this specific farmer she wants to help him? It's like, which, which one is it? Or is it it's about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's right. You know, so she's getting, I guess, stoned with two birds as it were, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, she keeps the bankers from getting what they want. And now the, the local person is indebted to her. It was like yeah. that guy who did the um, uh, Steelers wheel stuck in the middle with you thing in the uh, mm-hmm. reservoir dogs, uh, Michael, mm-hmm. whatever his name was. He was in that show, a uh, TV show after that, where people owed him favors and he would, he would, then he would help somebody and they would owe him a favor. So then later he would go to them and get the favor from them to help this next person, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, you know, Henrietta Rudd is the sort of person who would want to collect favors as well and let you re- remind you, you know, that you mm-hmm. are in her debt and you would never ever want to be in her debt, but sometimes right. you have to be. And so, so you yeah. deal with the devil, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like a payday loan, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> don't want that, so but you have to. End. Yeah. And you said that scene didn't, you know, progress the plot for, her, but you have to strike the balance. And you know, books can't just all be plot or mm-hmm. all just character. You know, you've struck a balance between the two, which makes it more interesting. And, and I like scenes like that where it's not necessarily plot forward, but it informs the character and gives you more, you know, yeah. looking more in depth about how their their inner cogs are working and stuff, what they're what they're doing. Sure. Yeah, I'm very very keen on character. Like I said, I could write 300 <laughs> pages on character and uh, nobody would buy it. So I gotta gotta make sure there's put put in some shootings and some kidnappings, some you know some right. bungled kidnappings as well. And you know, there's the scene. In, but but what happens is, you know, you end up with a cast of thousands, right? There's mm-hmm. the scene where they go do a kidnapping in the neighboring county, right? And so each one of those people, I you know, I want to make uh, because I enjoy this when I see it in other books, a fully fleshed out person. Right. Mm-hmm. So all those little side, you get like four new characters, you know, the, the two couples playing uh, cards, I think that was. Yeah. And they're so, playing cards. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, you build on that and you sort of talk about that. And these, each one of those people has a backstory, but you know, mm-hmm. all of a sudden you got a, you know, 1200 page doorstopper. Yeah. The, the thing part. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough balance. Uh, and so I appreciate your pointing that out, but yeah, it's, it's a tough balance, but I, I, I have as much fun as I can as, as, as reasonably allowed and still, you know, make money. I, li- I really like the trio of, of Everett, Jimmy, and Beans. I thought they were, they reminded me of um, the three from Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, kind of in a way. There's kind oh, of sure, bumbling yeah. along, not getting it right, quite right. Well, yeah, well, there's, you, yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a there's a Beans fan club uh, uh, around, which <laughs> I, I, I had not anticipated, but uh, yeah, he was a lot of fun. Beans he just wanted some pie. story. It's, he just needed. <laughs> he just wanted some chocolate pies. All he wanted. He just wanted <laughs> yeah, some yeah. pies. Just, just, just a, a straightforward guy. I'm, I'm a big fan of as uh, as anyone uh, who has ever met me uh, in my past 53 years on this earth has can tell you I'm a big fan of pie. You know, particularly mm. uh, me too. My, me too. Yeah, pie over cake any day. So, um, so oh, I abs- wanted to get, absolutely get, get those sorts. Get that in there uh, as well. So you know, the you put some things in there for, when you're writing a book, some things for yourself. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, as a big fan of pie, I was like, hey, me and beans. You know, we're simpatico. All right, so what, what's your favorite kind of pie? Then I have to ask. My, without a doubt, my favorite kind of pie is uh, my grandmother's chocolate meringue pie. God rest her soul. Okay, um, was just the the pinnacle of my existence. You know, nice. uh, it was, it was, you know, the, the big old thick meringue, the little, the little brown, you know, sugar about at the top. And it's just that everything just, it was just, it was absolute heaven. And uh, I, I miss that. Jay, do you like pie or you like cake? I don't think I'm big on either one. I, I like certain <gasps> pies. And certain you, cakes. you suck, so, Jay. <laughs> I, I mean, like as far as pie, like I'm not, I, I'm probably bigger on cake than on pie, to be honest with you. Like the only pie I really care for is like apple pie. I, I, like I don't care pie. much I'm, for like other stuff, but I'm not into a lot of different cakes either, but I'll take cake over pumpkin. Pie. Pumpkin pie is my favorite. Mm-hmm. And then probably pecan no. pie is my second. Oh, pumpkin pie, man. I've, you know, ne- I've never liked pumpkin pie for some reason. I don't know why, but just, it, I just don't pumpkin like pies. Yeah. Love pumpkin pie. Yeah. Absolutely. Love pumpkin pie. No. no. <laughs> we'll sneak some into the next book. Yeah. Pumpkin pie. The the return of beans, pumpkin pie. Right, edition. Right, right. <laughs> Bean pie. There we go. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, we could do some shepherd's shepherd's pie. You oh, can yeah, maybe throw some sure. beans in there. Yeah. So with, with those three or with any of the characters, did you take inspiration from any real life gangsters and sort of maybe put their attributes in Jimmy the His book family or, book or beans right or anybody? There. They're all well, in there. That, like, well, I'm talking like John Dillinger or, or you know, Al Capone. No, you know, any... Who did you dress up for Halloween? Is that why you wrote yeah. this? Because you used yeah. to dress up like these yeah, you know, It's all amalgams, you know, at, at that level. And so I uh-huh. did a lot of reading. Um, and I, 
I, I think what I found was uh, that a little piece from this and a little piece from that, and you start kind of making your own character. Uh, yeah. And I, I, th- I found that that was kind of a nice original way to do it. But yeah, the, you know, I wanted Everett to be the the brains of the operation. And of course, you know, yeah. he's thinking beyond because he's, he's taking those correspondence courses, you know, to, mm-hmm. to learn the business, to learn business. And I was like, well, that's the, that's the goofiest thing in the world. Let me see <laughs> if I can play with that. You know, a gangster taking correspondence courses. <laughs> I was like, that's so he's, He's the George Clooney from Oh Brother, We're Out There. That's he's no, George the, Clooney, the, yeah, the the organizer, the the smart guy, yeah. yeah. And of course, Jimmy the Hook being the the dumb muscle sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But of course, you know, if he's going to be the tough guy, then uh, you know you've got to wound him early on. You know, so I had to, yeah. you know, spoiler, alert, I had to break his arm pretty early. <laughs> uh, so I can't can't have the tough guy being fully tough. And then uh, you know, Beans was just uh, he was so much fun, of course. Um, Beans yeah. is the guy that oh they turned him into a toad. Is that he's that guy? <laughs> no, he was yeah he was he was he was I I, I think I you know I, I dislike earnestness in people. Uh-huh. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to be around <laughs> people who are too earnest about anything. You know, uh, but it was a lot of fun to write someone who was so earnest and just kept kind of missing the joke sometimes. Yeah. throughout the book and just somebody who seemed so straightforward and honest and because when you're dealing with crime fiction you know you know kidnappings and plots and things like that it gets so convoluted you know mm-hmm. i mean sometimes i'm watching a heist movie sometimes and you know they're going over what they're going to do and i'm like i don't know what the hell y'all are talking about. i'm just you know, <laughs> getting my popcorn i'm gonna sit here and you know watch the fireworks right um yeah so sometimes it could get so so heady and thoughty and things like that and i just wanted beans to kind of be you know in terms of a reader surrogate being like the kind of people like ah. Uh, I don't, I, I missed that, but go ahead. So yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he, he was, he was another fun character to write. Yeah. I like beads quite a bit. To beads, but he might've been my favorite one just because of it was pie. Yeah. He is. Well, I mean, you know, if you want to be straightforward, you know, mm-hmm. that's a, you know, somebody who likes, I mean, it's not, it's not complicated. You know, they're talking early on in the book about sort of a little more complicated dishes and things like that. Uh-huh. You know, the, uh, and of course getting it all wrong. As they would, so I think that when, uh, pie is a very simple, sort of straightforward, uh, little very easy thing to enjoy. I mean, who doesn't like pie? I mean, except for Jay, who doesn't like pie? So Jay, Jay, Jay's the only one that doesn't like pie. Apparently, there, there's certain <laughs> pies I like. So <laughs> you picked like the most basic apple pie, like the, the safest <laughs> answer. We try to have pie, patriotic. Picked. We can't. Maybe, we can't. Maybe, write I, on did, maybe I didn't grow up eating pies. I don't know. I I don't. <laughs> do you like do you like sliced cheese on your apple pie? Because that's a thing. Ooh. That's not a thing, is it? That's a thing. I, I, putting, I like hot apple cheese on your apple pie. On I, I've seen people put cheese on pie, but I've I, seen people yeah, do that. That would things. ruin it. That would. <laughs> that would ruin it. Those don't go together. Apples and, and cheese. People look it up. That's a that's a real thing. Apple pie no. with cheese on top. That is a good <laughs> no, no, people no. do that. It's, it's, it is not for me. It is not for me. But uh, I prefer <laughs> a, ice cream on hot apple pie. But uh, people can put your cheese. But you know, you put a slice of cheese on a slice of apple. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. I don't do that either. <laughs> Jay, Jay's like, oh, cheese and apples what, is gross. If, Is this like a South thing, or I don't know. <laughs> I've never had it, but it, it probably is a South thing, to be honest. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm running out of notes of uh, things to put on pie, so are we going to talk about <laughs> it much longer? Because I've only got, I've got, no, one thing got left. some broccoli, and spinach, and yeah. I don't know uh, about all that, Jay. That sounds <laughs> no, terrible. I'm running out of things. So, um, so you mentioned earlier that you know. We've mentioned that it's it's about what ten years in between your last one, last book, and this book. Um, what's changed? I mean, besides the fact that this one was in the middle of COVID, but you see, is there anything that changed as far as like publishing or your approach to it, or you know? We're talking ten years. What what's changed besides gray hair and all that stuff? Yeah. The um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the, I don't know what you're talking about gray hair. Uh, so yeah, you know, I, the, the business of publishing, um, is something that, uh, uh, 99% of the people can speak more to than me. Um, in the time, in the 10 years, I am still holed up in my, uh, office writing my book, you know? So yeah, I think that, uh, people tend to, from 10 years ago as a reader, you know, things seem to be a lot more, uh, fragmented. Yeah. And I think probably from a writer as well there. And so in some ways, there are a lot more opportunities to publish um, from what you're doing. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't have as much, I think, um, if I remember right, uh, you know, the self-publishing, indie publishing, you know, 10 years ago, it seems like that was um, 
as the uh, meme says, uh, frowned upon in this establishment. You know, <laughs> but you know now I think people have really leaned into kind of the indie publishing and the self publishing. I think it's working out great for so many things. So we, we're getting a whole lot more voices um, through mm-hmm. that medium. So there were other options in terms of publishing books. Uh, for me over 10 years. Um, uh, and so uh, I don't think 10 years, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, uh, my book being published with Lake Union, I don't think would have happened 10 years ago. So 10 mm-hmm. years ago, it was, uh, you know, Country Hardballs with a small press, Tyrus Books, which was uh, uh, owned by someone who was owned by someone who was owned by someone who was bought by Simon & Schuster. So sort of yeah. the uh, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, sucking up, smallifying, uh, bring, consolidating uh, of mm-hmm. publishing has certainly gone gone on over the past 10 years, but it, ha- it has uh, allowed a lot more people, it seems like, to get their books out there um, yeah. in terms of self-publishing and indie publishing. So, it's been, so at, from a reader's perspective, for me, it's been great because if there's somebody I like who's written a book, the chances are, you know, there's, uh, you know, and it's a good book, I, could, I can get my hands on it and I don't have to wait for, you know, someone at, you know, Random House to decide that this is one of their handful of books that they're going to promote this year. So because it could come out on, you know, whatever, you know, backwater press or something like that. And I can right, read it right. because I don't I don't care as much about myself. I don't care as much about the publisher of the books I mm-hmm. read as I do about reading a good book. So I think that's fantastic. I, I yeah. So I don't know if that was the answer to your question, but over 10 no, years, it's, it's, I have found it's, I'm it's, able to read more books. Because we've talked about it before on the show. Like, it seems to be yeah. more outlets. I mean, it might mm-hmm. be, you know, imprints of, of several other places, but still it seems like more outlets now because you can do self-publishing if you need to, and you have outlets like Amazon and, and what's the other one that people use for self publishing. Uh, Ingram spark. Yeah. Pl- places like that sure. where, you, you know, you, you don't even wait for a publisher. You just do it to get it out there and then see what happens. You know, so yeah. I, and I, I think, I think that lately, you know, there's uh, in the past year or so, there's sort of been an uptick in terms of serialized fiction on uh Substack, for example, yeah. or other yeah. newsletters and blogs and things like that. So, I think the return of serialized fiction, I find uh, super interesting. That's a different way to tell a story. That's not, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that's not, not for me um, necessarily, you know, the sort of the, uh, from a writer, but as a reader, I, you know, I love that sort of thing of, of looking forward to what's coming out next week. So the serialized mm-hmm. fiction on newsletters and Substack, I think is something that uh, maybe we didn't have as much of, or certainly wasn't yeah. as prevalent or easy, as easy to get as it is now uh, 10 years later. Because it, it's kind of why I wanted to ask you because there's there such a long period in between the, the two books. Whereas if someone was releasing one every year, you know, they would see the changes every year gradually. But with you 10 years apart from these two, you know, I, I thought maybe it'd be like a big drastic change, you know, getting back into it. Well, I didn't do that 10 years ago, I didn't do that 10 years, you know. So, uh, yeah, no, to answer your question, no. <laughs> Um, because, because my, you know, I am not, um, out there engaged in the, uh, publishing businessy sort of thing right. as much as, you know, people who are really successful are, you know, mm-hmm. I just sit in my, you know, room and write my little book and send it out and 10 years later do another one. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I assume that he's much different from the people who uh, are really good at this. Um, but for me, it's, uh, uh, I just write, write the book and hope people enjoy it. Well, it sounds like the next one isn't going to be 10 years. You've already got at least a big chunk of it. Done, Maybe he'll like. sit on it for a while. I don't you know. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> save, well, it, well, well, save it for nine years. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, have you ever like decided to paint your bathroom and you know, start painting the bathroom? Like, you know, what we ought to do is like take this wall out. And then maybe kind of make an atrium here. And so you do that. And then you find out that like that wall was load bearing. And so then that part of your house is carrying it. So then you can't do anything with that. So you then have to move to a motel and buy another house and start all over again. Um, Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that, that can happen. The the writing is difficult. You're talking about blogs a second ago. Do you want to talk about, uh, you're the co-founder of do some damage. What do some damage is? Yeah, so back in I don't know, we've been around for you know more than a decade. Jay Stringer and I um, uh, talked to some folks about uh, starting up a blog, a crime fiction blog. There were a few, you know, back when blogging was was the thing. There were there were a few that came out, and so you know, it's me, Jay, and uh, I will forget people, but you know, uh, Dave mm-hmm. White, um, uh, Joel Charbonneau, uh, Russell McLean, 
Um, Scott Parker, who's still uh, with us, uh, as in not just alive on this planet, still with us, <laughs> but still blogging on Saturdays. Um, so, you know, we had, we had a lot of people um, who started out and who have come and gone. And we've been very fortunate to have uh, been able to host a number of fantastic writers. And it, you know, back then, 10, 12 years ago, when we when Deuce and Damage was coming out, there was a lot of discussion on blogs because that's where you went to talk about crime fiction. And so mm -hmm. if you go back and you look at Deuce and Damage from 10 years ago or so, you will find 20, 30 comments on all the blog posts. You know, you go now and people will say, oh, people go on Twitter or um, Instagram, you know, Facebook and say, hey, I read this um, great you know, or this post on this blog. And here's what I think yeah. about it. You know, so the so sort of the uh, I guess the uh, uh, infrastructure, the the work of that has has really changed in terms of uh, the community because the community uh -huh. has has moved elsewhere on their own terms and is able to comment. If they don't have to go to your stinky blog to comment, and a lot of times, you know, I did a lot of reading. Uh, you remember Google Reader? Um, I did a lot of you know RSS mm -hmm. feed readers, so you could get those things fed to you, and you know newsletters, so you don't have to go to the blog, of course, to read them. Not that you yeah. had to five years ago. So it's it has really changed. But for uh, 10, 12 years, we have been very, very fortunate. Uh, yeah. So I you, you know so do some damage right out. We had Needle Magazine mm -hmm. um, a while back, so you know that was uh, 10, 12 issues of that. So 10 years ago or so, it seemed like there was a uh, uh, a lot more. Uh, I suppose in the crime fiction that I was doing. So I don't know why it has taken so long because the past few years I hadn't been doing anything because I've worked on these dumb books. So it should, it should have been a lot, should have been a lot quicker. So my apologies to the 17 people who were waiting for this. Book. The next one won't take as long. So with you, with you working on the blog and, you know, interacting with all these other writers and stuff that has that informed your writing at all, getting to kind of work with all these other authors. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and so, you, so for me, what you have to do is just accept the fact that there are people um, who are so good, you can't do what they do. And so mm -hmm. you have to kind of find, uh, you know, what it is that you do, you know, um, uh, kind of claim your space. Uh, and then so you use them to strengthen you and build you up. And so uh, as a reader, I have been so fortunate to be able to run across, you know, so many great, uh, great authors out there like, uh, you know, Nikki Dawson. Um, her short stories, you know, gosh, she's got some boxing short stories, things like that. So when you read things like that, you think, gosh, I need to step up my game. So you mm -hmm. learn a lot of things from other writers um, when you are sharing things. And when from Do Some Damage, what that allows us to do is uh, review books, blog things. Mm -hmm. And I used to um, uh, write that used to be a good form for me to be a lot meaner and snarkier in my younger <laughs> days. Um, because something would happen, something, uh, the, um, you know, you guys probably, um, aren't aware of this, but every so often, um, something stupid happens in the publishing world. Oh, so never, now, never, 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 never happen. I know. Right. Uh, shocker. And so, you know, I would run to do some damage, write a blog post about it, making fun of whoever, you know, stepped on their <laughs> dick or whatever. And so I had a lot of fun doing that and people would, you know, comment and that's like, but now that sort of has moved to people on Twitter. You know, mm -hmm. and no. who, you know who can say the uh, the snarkiest thing in a sentence and then sit back to see how many retweets and likes it gets and that sort of thing. So the ra the that, rage bait, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, but so so it's sort of changed um, when you're talking about how how has publishing changed in the last ten years. Yeah, I think right. a lot of it has changed in uh, uh, where we go to make fun of things. <laughs> <You> know, <so laughs> is, is part of it. So uh, yeah, so that's that's been a lot of fun. But but do some damage has been fantastic in terms of um, helping me. Uh, be in contact with some of the, the best writers out there, whether they're blogging at Do Some Damage or whether mm -hmm. we are able to interview them. I mean, I, you know, a schmuck like me is not going to get interviews with most of the people I've talked to at Do Some Damage, you know? But when yeah. you have a blog behind you and you say, hey, I'm, I'm a blogger for this, can I talk to you about these things? And then I get to ask them questions about the book that I'm really interested in. So mm -hmm. that's been fantastic. That's how I feel about this show. Like, I'm the schmuck in to talk to all these cool people all the time. Yeah, you had a lot of cool people on the last time. The, You're you a schmuck, four, but... You know. 14 people from Bo Johnson's uh, anthology? Yeah. <laughs> Bo kind of threatened us. He said, if you don't have a sign, we might break your arms or something, but... Yeah, he'll do that, too. <laughs> He'll do that, too. Yeah. He, um, I'll send you some those are, uh, stuff offline. There's yeah, a, he, he, has, he, has a little, he has a little scary. Oh, so. yeah. Those, a those story really angry... Yeah. The, the story in the Toronto Star about what he did to one guy. 
it was um, <laughs> it was not it was not pretty because they used pictures and stuff. I mean, they had to take them down because they were so graphic. Yeah. But if, uh, you know, they did run some of the pictures, and you could go to uh, the uh, Wayback Machine and see the pictures of what. And, and uh, while he was doing, it, he kept on saying he was sorry. Yeah, well, yeah, he's Canadian, sorry. So of course, yeah. that's his sorry, breaking your arm. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. so what he did yeah. to that poor elderly woman? I don't know how he lives with himself. But, you know, <laughs> she was mouthing off, so it was kind of her own fault. <clears throat> Well, he drinks so, beer with ice, so I don't think you can expect much. From, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Is that a Canadian thing? Ice and beer? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rob says he's, he's psychotic because he drinks beer with his ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So before we get you out of here, we don't want to keep you all night because I know you got a party and stuff, but what are you reading right now? <laughs> Anything special you're reading? Yeah, well, I, I um, well, I, not it's not a crime fiction book, but if you guys want to look up <laughs> the craziest story, um, there's a book called uh, Arabia Fix about a failed Danish exploration of what is now Yemen in 1761. And it is the most boggling the mind sort of thing. It's these four guys, five guys who went down, the King of Denmark sent them down to study, um, you know, the uh, text, the architecture of the land of, of what's now Yemen in 1761. And the thing just completely goes off the rails and it's, it's, I, you know, you could you could call it a crime fiction book, but it's not fiction. It's fantastic. But, um, you know, that is what I'm reading now. But some of the books that I have read recently, I just had a, an event with uh, uh, John Seeley, who wrote a, a King Street Affair about the uh, crimes and uh, spies in Charleston, South Carolina. And Kent Wascombe's mm -hmm. uh, fourth book in his uh, four book trilogy, uh, West Florida, just came out. And so we were talking about that too. So John Seeley and Kent Wascom, I just recently read so that I could talk to them at a, a book event uh, this earlier this week. I mentioned Chris Harding Thornton's uh, uh, Little Underworld earlier, uh, you know, which takes place at the same time, which is just fantastic. So, you know, um, uh, there are uh, so many books out there. And uh, I think uh, James D.F. Hanna's uh, Henry Malone series, I've been getting into that. Um, so I had read kind of sporadically like book two and book four and things like that. But I'm trying to go back through and read those sorts of things in order because it's just I love what he does with the, uh, the sheriff character in terms of uh, the growth, you know, uh -huh, right. and uh, sort of the, in, in, you know, sometimes the descent, the growth of sort of machinations of what's going on over five, six, uh, seven, not over the novels. And so I had, uh, you know, been stupid and read a couple out of order. So it's nice to go back and read uh, what uh, James D.F. Hanna is doing, was, has been doing in order. So uh, that's mm -hmm. kind of on my, uh, my nightstand as well right now. Was the one book, is it The Great State of West Florida, this one? Yeah, yeah, that's the that's one, one, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that yeah, that's covered my eye the other day. Yeah, and so, you know, so Kent and the, um, uh, I know that you said, uh, we're getting rid of you, so uh, I, I know you're tired of my <laughs> oh, no, no, nonsense, no, no, no. but let me just tell you. We don't want to hold um, you. We, we, you, know, you get so so Kent's got four books out in this uh, wool sack series, and so it go, mm -hmm. one of them, uh, you know, they go back to pre-Civil War, and what I didn't, I guess I didn't understand well enough is that each book cover is tied to the time period of when the book takes place. Because uh, the, okay. the book cover, you know, if you see four books in a series, you know, if you get the Lord of the Rings and Hobbit and stuff like that, they're going to make all the covers look alike. Uh -huh. So, you know, hey, this is the book. This is a series. But Kent's series, uh, all the books. So uh, this one, Great State of Florida, uh, uh, West Florida, is kind of current and it's very um, kind of fun. And, uh, well, not, I don't know if fun, you know, it, early on, a, a kid puts a, a pool ball in a sock and starts whacking people. <laughs> you know, and uh, there's a there's a, there's a there's a real life Call of Duty game that they play like in in person. I mean, so it's it, of course it's Kent, so it's it's graphic and it's dark, but it's also mm -hmm. so propulsive. So I think that this cover sort of talks about how propulsive it is. But you go back, and the first one is Blood of Heaven, and it's got this great you know cover of Larry Field, and it's such, and then the New Inheritors, which takes place in the early you know twenties thirties, right, um, has that uh, great modern novel cover, and I thought you know mm -hmm. that's kind of they make the covers look like the time period of the book in a four book series. And I was like, that's, that's cool. That is, that is yeah. very interesting. I thought that was fantastic. Oh, well, I, said, I said series and series. Like what the hell do you want? No, Siri, not you, <laughs> silly goose. Do you have to read his in order or can you pick and choose? No, it, 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 he, you know, as Kent will tell you, wanting to sell his books. No, you don't have to read them. All <laughs> no, <there>. just read <laughs> it. Uh, whichever one you can find. Just, just whichever, which, yeah, right, whichever one's in the bookstore, buy it. Whichever one's the yeah. most expensive, pay, pay money for that. One. Uh, I don't think you have to read them in order. Um, you know, okay. he does a he does a good job. And this, I, 
uh, I think this is pretty difficult to do well. And he does it well in kind of giving you enough of the backstory from the earlier books, but not bogging you down. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've read some of those books where you pick up the fourth one in the series and it's like, as Frank remembered three years ago, <laughs> he was, you know, I say, oh, my God, Frank, come on, man. What are you doing? It's like the previously on on a TV show. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's so up. tough to do. Right. Last um, week's so, episode. So, so, Kit, so I think Kit does a smooth job. So I don't think you would be lost, and I think each one stands on its okay. own. But uh, you know, and so to answer your question, no, I don't think you have to. Although you get a different experience if you start at the beginning, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, because I saw that one the other day. I thought it looked interesting, and then I was reading oh, yeah. like, the reviews. They're like, "Oh, this is book four. but I didn't know that was book four. So yeah, that could be that could be that could be a tough one, you know. Uh, but again, yeah. you know, you don't you don't have to read the county line from nineteen thirty three before you read uh -huh. country hardball because hell I wrote them in the wrong order. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, but uh, yeah, you don't, you know, like, but I, I mentioned Tolkien. I think you probably have to read the second one. Um, whatever the, uh, the two towers or whatever, before you read the first yeah, one, because his three, because he wrote them all together. Right. And the publishers put them up in three. So um, that makes sense. But Kent, you know, <laughs> Jay, don't, don't, you've, don't you like probably have no, have you even seen the Lord of the Rings movies, Jay? Okay. No. Jay, yeah. you've, I don't know why we're even friends, Jay. Why are we the even day friends? this looked <laughs> miserable to me. <laughs> <laughs> they look miserable. They're so good. You hate nah. fantasy stuff anyway, so. Yeah. Never read The Hobbit or anything? Nothing? No. 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 Steve, so this is what I have to deal with all the time. Just I yeah. like some, I like fantasy movies. I mean, my favorite one's probably Labyrinth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that note, is that, is that the last one you saw when it came out in theaters? That's the last time you watched a fantasy movie in 1987. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, yeah, J Brad, what you the thing you emailed me earlier? I, I see what yeah. you're talking about. I'm, yeah, I'm so. I, I feel for you, man. I'm so, I'm so, the county line is rid of this guy now. So I'm being teamed up on now. So <laughs> the county line, Steve Ruddle, uh, wherever you can find books. Pick it on up. the Amazons, the Barnes and Nobles. I saw it. I saw it on Barnes. I saw it on Barnes and Nobles bookshelf the other day when I was in there. So nice. Go buy to Barnes yeah. and Noble. Very cool. Pick it up and make a sequel coming sometime in the future. We'll see when it gets yeah, here. I, I expect <laughs> to. Have, I expect to. I expect to have it out the door in the next uh, next couple of months. So. Oh, I'd like to say nice. decade. It, <laughs> next, <laughs> I got, next decade. No, I got bills to pay. I got. I got a mortgage. I got to pay. Yeah. yeah. So thank you Outlaws, guys. Outlaws gun running. County, County, and a recipe for the world's happen. greatest drink, the bunny hole. And so uh, that's right, yeah. And maybe, maybe, a, maybe you should add bonus content in the chocolate pie recipe, oh. for like Patreon exclusive or something like that. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Get the little, little, uh, the index card that was written down in my grandma's handwriting. Yeah. You know, That'd be cool. That is, that needs to be in the next book. Yeah, in the right, back, yeah, yeah. a secret recipe. Yeah. Give somebody a reason to buy the book. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah definitely it. check it out. It was, it was a lot of fun. If you like cool. Bonnie and Claude. John Dellinger type stuff. Check this one out. It's, it if was those cool. are your heroes. Those are your heroes. <laughs> yeah. if you look up to those guys. Pick this one up. <laughs> now you could step into the world of Cottonmouth and Henrietta and the others. So. And Beans. <laughs> and, and Beans. That's favorite. He is. <laughs> well, Steve, Steve, Steve we so appreciate for, you coming uh, on. To, uh, Thank you all very much. This is great. <laughs> Two dose for microphones. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. The dog is like, let's go, Steve. We're yeah. ready to leave. Oh, he, yeah. He's time to go out. I told him it would be about an hour and a half, and he's he keep count time. So. County line, see Weddle. So pick it up. Pick it up. That's going to do it. Brad, you got anything else? Nope. Oh, that's Steve, it. Steve, appreciate, appreciate you, man. So Thanks, guys. It. Love see you, Jay. Ya. I know you do. <laughs>